All right, so let's dive into the four, probably three most common violations and the three most common sections that you will deal with. We are going to talk a little bit about section four. I'm sorry, the fourth section is section six. Section six of RESPA provides borrowers and consumer protection relating to the servicing of their loans. Now, I understand that most of us, uh, whatever profession you happen to be in, whether it's the title, uh, I know there's some uh, licensed mortgage loan originators in here, uh, as well as real estate agents like myself that have a real estate license, as well as a producer's license. We probably won't see a lot of the violations of Section 6 because it mainly deals with the consumer and the servicer post-closing, all right? But I want to talk a little bit about it just so that you know that it's there. Um, if a borrower has a problem with their loan servicer, they have to send what's called a qualified written request. Now, a qualified written request requires the person's name, the loan number, and a specific question they are inquiring about. They can't just write their letter and go, I think you've cheated me. That does not qualify, or let's use the word constitute, does not constitute a qualified written request because the question wasn't specific. And that is one of the requirements to consider what's called a qualified written request. So if a borrower sends a valid qualified written request, the servicer has to acknowledge the receipt of that request within 20 business days. You're going to notice the time frame in here are business days. So please do not get that confused with calendar days. All right. So the servicer has to respond within 20 business days that they have in fact received the qualified written request. They have 60 business days to respond to that request or make the appropriate corrections if they were in fact wrong. All right. Now, there's a little bit more here and I know that because I wrote the words more. <laughs> up on the screen. During that 60 days that they have to close the case out, either solve the problem, correct what's wrong or whatever, they are not, they being the servicer, are not allowed to report to the credit agencies concerning any overdue or late payments because of the qualified written request. So you get what I'm saying? The borrower can send a valid written request and in that time frame that they're solving the issue, they also can't be dinged by the credit agency because it was late or uh, inappropriate amount. So that's kind of a key point that you want to remember that. During that time frame, you can't be reported as late. The, if the borrower finds they were in fact in violation, they can bring a private lawsuit or they could actually get what's called a class action where a group of borrowers get together and they have a three year time frame with which to bring that lawsuit about. So if there's a violation that is, uh, borrowers can get actual damages and they can get additional damages if there's a pattern, i.e. maybe there's a class action lawsuit, so there's a pattern. They have cheated three or 4,000 people uh, in this same manner. One of the most common ones, and a, an example if you're having a hard time, would be the one that we just mentioned. If, let's say, Susie makes her house payment where they're escrowed, and then the lender marks her a late fee, which wasn't late, <clears throat> that would be a violation of Section 6 or could potentially be a violation of Section 6. That would be one that the consumer would deal directly with their servicer on that potential problem. All right? Now, 
the three, the next three I want to talk about are uh, the most common ones, and there's been a huge change in this one coming up right now. Section 8 of RESPA provide, prohibits a person from giving or accepting anything of value. Now, that's key right there. Anything of value or for referrals or settlement service businesses related to a federally related uh, mortgage loan. So in other words, you can't give kickbacks. You can't give loan splitting, you, uh, fee splitting. You can't give a professional services fee. Uh, call it whatever you want to call it. It's a violation to give anything of value. So that could be construed as tickets to a concert, uh, going out to dinner, a $100 bill. And despite all of the fallacies that you guys think about, there is no de minimis level in that anything of value. I hear this all the time when people go, well, if it's less than $25. No, that's not, not true. There has never been mentioned any dollar about anywhere in any of these codes. There is no de minimis value. The actual rule says giving or accepting anything of value. So theoretically, technically is a better word, a $5 gift card is something of value. All right. It also prohibits a person from accepting any part of a charge or service that they don't perform. Now, here's where the key starts coming in. <clears throat> we are going to talk in another class today, but I'll give you a little preview. There's been a huge change in Section 8 called these Marketing Service Agreements, the MSAs, where if there is something of value that has given, as long as it is commensurate with the act that is performed, all right? Now, I'm going to s jump over to another industry here real quick uh, to kind of give you a better example so you can see the light. Home warranties used to pay uh, agents for selling home warranties. Then this rule came out and they stopped that because they couldn't give anything of value. Then what they started doing was calling it this marketing service agreement, which is on the border of being illegal. Now, an MSA is not in and of itself illegal as long as it's followed to the T. The problem is the potential for it to be illegal is so great that the risk is, does not want to be borne by a lot of the companies. So what they started doing was saying, oh, well, if the agent has the person fill out the application for the home warranty, then in fact they have done something and we can pay them for that. Now, that is entirely true on the surface. RESPA says you can't give anything of value. It further goes on to say, if they do something of value, they can be paid for that. The question is, when do you pay them? How do you pay them? Because you could start getting into this whole, well, if they fill out the application and it doesn't close, are you still paying them? The answer you should say to yourself in your head is yes, because if you only pay them on the applications they take that close, you are now skirting that line that looks like it was a referral for business because you aren't paying them for ones that didn't close. So that's kind of the key. And uh, here's another example. Uh, I'm sure you guys all have heard the big Z word that everybody hates right now in the real estate world, which I don't understand, but that's neither here nor there. People are putting, you know, buying zip codes uh, for buyers and they have been accused several times of violating RESPA. The key to that is not every lead that an agent gets is a closing lead. So it's not construed as a referral because that agent who buys the zip code is paying a flat fee for all of the leads rather than just the ones that close. So uh, Zillow is claiming they are a marketing fee. It is not a referral fee. 
That's the claim. It has been tested two or three times, but I'm telling you there are a lot of compliance people that don't like it. So that's why I was saying a minute ago, the potential for it to be a violation is so, runs such a narrow razor's edge, a lot of companies think the risk is too high to even do that. But, so you can't give referral fees for business, basically. Now, Section 9 of RESPA prohibits home sellers from requiring home buyers to purchase settlement services in general from a particular company, either directly or indirectly, uh, as a condition of the sale. Most of us have translated that into title work. You can't force a buyer to buy the title work. The true rule says settlement services, so it could be anything. But title work is the one that's the most common that you see. Now, if there's a violation, buyers can actually get up to three times the amount charged for that title work. Now, here's the key point I want to go back and make to you. A lot of these attorneys are very concise in what they say. And because you can battle words, one of the key terms here in this is you cannot require the home buyer to purchase. Now, what that means, and this has been tested, that if the seller is paying for both sides of the title work, then they in fact can choose the title company, okay? The rule for violation says you cannot require them to pay. If the seller's paying, i.e. the buyer's not paying, it's not a violation. So keep that in mind when you start hearing these people go, well, you can't make the buyers use this title company. No, it doesn't say you can't make them use it. It says you can't make them pay for it. They can use it if the seller says, I'll pay both the sides of the title insurance policy. Then they can, in fact, pay, uh, pick it. Section 10 of RESPA deals with escrow accounts. RESPA does not require lenders to have an impound account. Key point here. RESPA doesn't say a lender has to have an escrow account. The loan that has been chosen by the borrower or the lending company will require, if there is an escrow or an impound account, RESPA only regulates if there is one, then these are the rules. So understand that Section 10 does not require impound accounts. Section 10 limits the amount of money if there is an impound account. Now, there is a formula now by which uh, lenders must seed that impound account. And basically, it is one-twelfth of the annual payment, i.e. one month. So it's one-twelfth of the payment that is required for the seed amount for any escrow that they create, whether it's home insurance or taxes, which are the two most common ones, all right? Now, they also have this ability to add a cushion of one-sixth, which is two-twelfths, which is two months. So one-sixth is two months. So in essence, what they can get is one month to seed and two months of cushion to make sure that if the taxes go up or the insurance goes up, that the escrow account is not deficient. So basically what you end up seeing is three months going into that account. That would be the maximum that can be taken by the lender under Section 10. You've got one month and then a two-month cushion. That's so, so the maximum they can take is three months, all right? The lender also has to perform annually an audit of that account to see if the amount is over what is needed to be. If it's over by more than $50, 
then that lender has to return that amount to the borrower, okay? Obviously, if it's short, they can seek that out as well. Um, but I'm telling you, they're probably going to find that out way sooner than every once a year. If it becomes short, they'll probably call, call some money due. So what you've got there are Section 8, 9, and 10. Those are the three most common ones that we're going to deal with in our business as title producers. Uh, Section 8's no kickbacks. Section 9's requiring people to use certain services requiring, I see, I even said it myself, <laughs> Section 9 requires, uh, does, can't require people to pay for certain settlement services, and Section 10 deals with excessive escrow amounts. If you have any questions, I'll deal with it here on break. Um, if you're at home listening, feel free to email me, raymond at realuniversity.com. We're going to come back and talk a little bit more about uh, RESPA right after this.